Okay, so let's start by giving a very general definition of splicing. It is a process of removing introns, and in some cases even exons, from the pre-mRNA during or after transcription. I am going to split the content of this video into three parts, where we will see what and when splicing starts, how it is done, and towards the end we will see why splicing is done. Let's start by simply sketching out the pre-mRNA, where we have the simplest case possible for splicing, with two exons, E1 and E2, which have an intron I in the middle. Now, introns in pre-mRNA have a syntax which tends to be very specific. In this specific video, I'm only going to talk about the introns of the pre-mRNA. So, majority of the transcripts made by the RNA polymerase 2. Now, what do I mean by syntax? Let's take a closer look. Following immediately at the end of the exons, or the other way of saying is that the 5' prime end of the intron, we usually see a consistent presence of guanine and uracil nucleotides. This GU location is called the 5' prime splice site. And then intron continues, and towards the end of the intron, you have a short sequence with a lot of adenines. And one of these adenines, any one in this sequence, is what we call the branch point. Immediately after the branch point, we have a short pyrimidine track made up of a lot of U's and C's. And after this pyrimidine stretch at the 3' prime end of the intron, you find a consistent enrichment of adenine and guanine nucleotides. This A and G dinucleotide is called the 3' prime splice site. This entire stretch of branch point, pyrimidine nucleotides, and 3' prime splice site occurs in the last 40 or so nucleotides of the intron. And these specific signals or sequences in the intron, the 5' prime splice site, branch point, pyrimidine stretch, and 3' prime splice site, make up the intron syntax. This sort of syntax is present in majority, like 90% of the pre-mRNA. We call these introns U2 type introns. And we will soon see why they are called this way. The remaining subset of pre-mRNA, the leftover 10%, usually falls into a minority case which have the U12 type introns. In this type of introns, the 5' prime splice site has AU instead of GU. The branch point and the pyrimidine stretch is very similar, and the 3' prime splice site has AC instead. So now we see that even in the pre-mRNA, you can have different type of introns, which means that their syntax is very different. Since we're on this subject of introns, I want to expand your knowledge on the fact that there are many types of introns in general. We have the nuclear pre-mRNA introns, which are the U2 type and the U12 type introns that we just saw. These specific introns are recognized by a set of proteins that form spliceosome. These proteins are named U2, U1, U12, and so on. And then we have introns which are very specific to pre-mRNA from organelles, like the mitochondria and chloroplasts. Some bacteria, specifically archaea bacteria, have a bunch of introns as well. Their introns are either self-splicing in nature, or they need some help from endonucleases. In eukaryotes, there are two types of self-splicing introns, group 1 and group 2. Self-splicing suggests that they are self-catalyzing meaning that they are perfect examples of RNA enzymes or ribozymes, which suggests that they don't need any protein or enzymes to remove them. They take care of themselves. And these are found in a few mRNAs, but a lot of tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. In addition, we have a class of tRNA introns that are dependent on endonucleases, much like the bacterial introns. Okay, so that's a lot of information, but for this video, we will focus only on the spliceosome-dependent introns. And out of the two that we have discussed, we are only going to talk about the U2-type introns, because that's the majority case. Now, getting back on track when we ask what and when starts this splicing process, and specifically asking this question in context of U2-type introns, the answer is that when the intron syntax is recognized by the spliceosome proteins, the splicing starts. Calling them simple proteins is technically not correct. In reality, they are small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, or SNRMPs for short, which means that they are made up of small nuclear RNA and they have some protein component. The small nuclear RNAs are about 200 nucleotides on average in humans. And in yeast or simple eukaryotes, they're quite longer, about 1,000 bases. The protein components of these SNRMPs is actually quite diverse. 
and they have on the order of about a hundred or more proteins associated with them. Now, there are five major snRNPs that are involved in the processing of the U2 type introns. They are simply named U1, U2, U5, 4, and 6. The U4 and 6 usually hang around in a dimer, and we call them the dye snRNP. And when recruited, the U5 joins this dimer, and we call the three of them a tri snRNP. One thing to keep in mind about the RNA part of these snRNP is that these RNAs take on secondary structures, and each of these snRNPs have multiple subunits of proteins. So if we were to represent this snRNP in a realistic sense, we would see that they have an extensive secondary RNA structure, which means that they are folded onto themselves, but the 5' prime and the 3' prime end of these RNAs remain free. The folded RNA secondary structures are recognized by specific proteins, and this entirely makes up the snRNP. But going forward, I will simply represent these snRNPs as ball structures, instead of making them this complicated. So this snRNA and the protein subunits make up one snRNP, and we have five different types, namely U1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so now that we understand when and what starts splicing, Let's see how it is actually done. Since we are focusing on U2 type introns, I am going to draw out the pre mRNA and the U2 type intron specifically. Here we have its 5' splice site containing the GU and a short stretch of AAGU consensus next to it. And towards the end of the intron, we have the branch point A, pyrimidine stretch, and AG, which is the 3' splice site. The beginning of the recognition is at the 5' splice site where the U1 snRNP with its snRNA pairs with the GU at the 5' splice site in the pre-mRNA. So just that, I won't draw all snRNP interactions in this excessive detail. But moving on, just keep in mind that each of the snRNPs have their snRNA pairing with the pre-mRNA. Now, this recognition of U1 is further stabilized by SR proteins that bind at the end of the exon and they're called SR because they have serine and arginine repeats in them. The SR proteins bind both RNA and the splicing proteins, and by and large they act like a scaffold protein, and sometimes they can also regulate splicing. The adenine in the branch point is recognized by a branch point binding protein, also known as splicing factor 1. The AG in the 3' splice site of the intron is recognized by U2AF protein, which comes as a dimer. The 65 subunit binds the pyrimidine stretch and the 35 to the splice site. These numbers 35 and 65 are simply molecular weight of these proteins in kilodaltons. The SF1 and U2AF dimer has cooperative binding effect to the RNA, meaning that if one of them binds, the affinity of the other one increases drastically. So this is the recognition stage, where GU is bound by the U1 snRNP, branch point by SF1, 3' splice site by the U2AF complex. This recognition actually takes place in a looped conformation, since introns and eukaryotes can be very long. So the U1 at the 5' splice site of the intron interacts with the SF1 and the U2AF proteins. The SR proteins also help in this looping process by bringing the ends of the exons closer. This recognition complex is called early complex sometimes also referred to as a stable and committed complex. After the E complex assembles, U2 snRNP is added to it. The U2 usually replaces SF1 and U2AF proteins, which means now at the E complex, we still have U1 bound at the 5' splice site, but now the U2 pairs at the branch point and a bit with the pyrimidin stretch. The SR protein still sticks around in this complex, and this complex is called A complex, also referred to as the pre spliceosome complex. Following the A complex formation, U5, U4, and U6 join this party. These three together, as we saw before, are called tri snRNPs. So we can draw out this new complex again. In this complex, the U6 interacts with U1, U4 with the pyrimidine stretch and 3' splice site, and the U2 snRNP. The U5 takes on the role of bridging the exons, and all these snRNPs in general, which means that it replaces the SR proteins in its function. And this complex is called the B1 complex, 
which is also known as pre-catalytic spliceosome complex. Now, to make it catalytically active, the U1 and U4 proteins are kicked out of this complex. So in our new conformation, the U6 replaces the U1 at the 5' prime splice site. The branch point and pyrimidine stretch are still paired with the U2. And the U5 is scaffolding the entire complex. So in this transition, U4 is released and U6 replaces U1. A side note is that U4 actually only functions to carry around U6, just like TF2F carries around RNA polymerase 2. So this new complex that we have just drawn out is called the B2 complex. And this is the catalytically active spliceosome complex. Now that this is active, it proceeds with the first splicing reaction, which is the transesterification, where the hydroxyl of the adenosine at the branch point attacks the phosphate of the guanosine at the 5' splice site, which means that the exon is cut off from the intron at the 5' splice site. And the G from the 5' splice site is attached to the adenine at the branch point. This reaction is catalyzed by U6 SNRNP, which remains bound to the 5' splice site. And likewise, the U2 is still paired at the branch point. Now, if the exon is cut off at one end, you don't want to lose it. So the U5 SNRNP keeps the exons in the complex while still interacting with U6 and the downstream exon. I feel like U5 SNRNP is the unsung hero of this entire splicing process. Anyways, this complex is called the catalytic 1 complex, which moves on to the second transesterification step, where the 3' splice site is cleaved off. In this step, the upstream exon gets ligated to the downstream exon. So essentially, the 5' exon attacks the 3' splice site. So after this step, the two exons have ligated, and the intron is removed, but it is still bound to the SNRMPs. This intron structure looks like a lasso or a lariat, and that's why this is called the intron lariat. And this complex, where the lariat is still attached to the SNRNP, is called the catalytic 2 complex. Now, to fill in some gaps that I've left behind, these steps where SF1, U2AF, SR protein, and U1, U4 was removed, these steps depend primarily on the activity of special RNA helicases. I haven't drawn them out for simplicity. The two transesterification steps are catalyzed by U6 SNRMP, which has a catalytic core that contains two metals. Okay, so we said that there are these two transesterification steps, but let's just take a look at what is going on in these two steps. In the 5' splice site, you have the G and U, which are connected by phosphodiester linkage. Now if we zoom into the branch point a bit more, we can flesh out the sugar and the phosphate linkages, which is followed by the 3' end of the intron. Now, the 2' hydroxyl of the sugar with the adenine attacks the phosphate of the guanosine at the 5' splice site. And that's the first transesterification step. Now, the upstream exon is left with a 3' hydroxyl, and the GU is linked to the second carbon of the sugar. And this is the loop in the intron lariat that we saw in the C1 complex. In the second step of transesterification, the 5' end of the exon, which has a free hydroxyl group at the third carbon, attacks the 3' splice site. Specifically, the hydroxyl here attacks the phosphate of the guanosine at the 3' splice site. This releases the intron lariat away, and the exons are joined to give you the mRNA. And hopefully that sort of clears up the details about this transesterification process. Now that you understand when and what starts splicing and how it is done, let's try to look at why splicing is done. At this point, the importance of splicing shouldn't come as a surprise, but let's walk through it. In the simplest case where you have an intron between two exons, the canonical splicing will remove the intron and join the two exons. Now let's make things a little more complicated. Now say that there is another intron and an exon in the pre-mRNA. Now, by canonical splicing, you remove all introns independently and join the exons. So you get E1, E2, and E3 in the mRNA. But you can also imagine that splicing can occur between exon 1 and 3. So you remove exon 2 as well. And now the mRNA will get E1 and E3 only. And if you have a fourth exon, you can imagine a wide number of possibility for the spliced exons. So in the most basic form, the splicing removes introns, because introns are non-protein coding in function. Otherwise, you would just produce a bad and defective protein. 
And if you have different combinations possible from the splicing of different exons, you can generate a diverse set of mRNAs, which will impact the kind of proteins you produce. And for your note, these diverse RNAs are called isoforms. So the same gene can be used to make different RNAs by joining exons in very different combinations. And this increases the diversity of proteins a typical cell can produce. This rearrangement of exons to give rise to isoforms is called alternative splicing. Just to make it more explicit, in alternative splicing, if you want to make E1 and E3 from this pre-mRNA, you have to get rid of exon 2. In canonical splicing here, the 3' splice site and the exon 2 will engage in the second transesterification step. But if you have to remove the second exon, the 3' splice site must engage in the transesterification with exon 1. So there must be a specific protein that should prevent the exon 2 from taking part in the second transesterification step. Or in contrast, you can also do this by having a set of proteins at exon 1 that attracts this 3' splice site to exon 1, essentially working like a magnet. Maybe they attract exon 3 specifically and not exon 2. So there can be multiple ways in which alternative splicing can work. Okay, that was just a side note. So far, we have considered introns and exons, but in worms, the model organism being C. elegans, exists another type of element known as an outron, which is involved in the process of trans-splicing, which means that exons from two different RNAs are joined together. Let's see how that works. Consider this pre-mRNA. In this pre-mRNA, the 5' UTR has a branch point and a 3' splice site. Worms also have this special RNA known as splice leader RNA which is a short RNA containing about 40 or so nucleotides long exon, followed by an intron. In trans-splicing, this SL RNA is used, and the branch point adenine from the pre-mRNA attacks the 5' splice site of the SL RNA in the first transesterification step. And in step 2, the hydroxyl from exon of the SL RNA attaches to the exon of the pre-mRNA. Now as a result of this, you get the SL RNA exon in front of the pre-mRNA thereby replacing the 5' UTR which existed on the pre-mRNA. So why do worms do this? One use could be the transfer of the cap. Say for some reason the pre-mRNA didn't have the 5' cap, which would reduce the stability of the RNA. The SL RNA has the 5' cap. So through this process of trans-splicing, you can transfer the exon, which contains the 5' cap, to the mRNA, which fixes the mRNA stability issues. So this process of trans-splicing cuts out the 5' UTR, and that UTR is called the outron, and it is attached to the intron of the SLRNA. The outron removal results in this weird Y-branched lariat. This is in contrast to the intron lariat, which you get in the normal splicing. So outrons and introns are very different. So far, outrons have not been observed in humans. All right, so we have covered alternative splicing, canonical splicing, where only intron is removed, and we have seen trans splicing. The last type of splicing I want you to know is called back splicing. Consider this pre-mRNA, where normally in the second intron, the branch point would attack the 5' splice site, and then the exon 2 will be attached to the exon 3, and that's the canonical splicing. The step 2 goes in the forward direction, and as a result, you get the classic intron lariat. Now, in some cases, the 3' end of the exon will go in the backward direction and attack its own 5' end, meaning that the 3' splice site of the previous intron is attacked. So exon 2 will be removed as this circular RNA instead. And this kind of splicing is called a backward splicing. Back splicing is typically seen in pathological condition. In normal cases, the first intron is co-transcriptionally removed before the RNA polymerase gets to the second exon. So such events of backsplicing are rare. But backsplicing does happen in normal conditions as well. And that's pretty much it for this video.